Let's talk a little bit more about those specific currents, the eastern boundary currents and western boundary currents that I just talked about because they have some specific properties and they're things that we're probably familiar with but don't realize we're familiar with and they're certainly things that affect our daily lives or at least uh, our, our climate and weather patterns and really our lifestyles on the east and west coast of the United States due to these different boundary currents. You recall that western boundary currents are those that occupy the western edge of the subtropical gyre. So the Kuroshio current and the, Nor and the Gulf Stream are the two best known and really the, the most well studied uh, of the western boundary currents. Western boundary currents tend to be the warmest, they tend to be very fast moving, they tend to be very energetic, they tend to be very narrow comparatively, and they also shed what are called eddies, these independently rotating whirls of water of diameters from 30 to perhaps 100 miles wide that move off independently of their own, uh, I don't want to say their own will, but of their own momentum off into the ocean. Sometimes these eddies are called rings, so we want to talk a little bit about those. Um, the Gulf Stream specifically extends from the tip of southern Florida to the coast of Newfoundland. It brings warm water from the equator up towards, up along the east coast of the United States. It is really the main reason why it's so humid in the summer along the east coast of the United States. It certainly moderates climate along the east coast of the United States. And as a boy growing up in West Palm Beach, Florida and visiting the beaches in Palm Beach, Florida, you can actually see the Gulf Stream. It's like this river. You can see the ripples of the Gulf Stream as you look out and you can see the waving horizon as a Gulf Stream and this intense current moves northwards along the coast of Florida. In fact, the flows of the Gulf Stream are more than 300 times the flows of the Amazon River, one of the largest rivers in the world. And so you can imagine this river moving through the ocean at about five knots, um, transporting huge volumes of water. So these western boundary currents are really important for moving water, moving heat, moving all kinds of things um, all where they occur. Well, one of the earliest people to recognize the importance of the Gulf Stream was Benjamin Franklin. And Benjamin Franklin is known for lots of different things, invented bifocals, he was a diplomat, all sorts of incredible things. This man uh, was just sort of a genius and a jack of all trades and was involved in all kinds of things. He was even involved in a little bit of oceanography. Because in talking with his cousin, who was a whaling captain out of Nantucket, he realized that there was a major current that flows along the east coast of the United States. Now, at the time, Ben Franklin was in charge of mail delivery between Europe, excuse me, between U.S. and Europe. I don't know his exact capacity. Of course, you can look that up in a history book or on the Internet. In any case, Franklin was looking for a faster way to get mail delivered back and forth between America and Europe. And, of course, it had to be done by ship. And in talking to his cousin, he came to realize there was a current that maybe his mail ships could take advantage of. Now, the whaling captains knew about the Gulf Stream for a long time. But whaling is kind of a dirty, grubby, kind of looked down upon industry, at least during those times. And so the remarks of the whaling captains to people who were doing commerce or military operations were really not paid much attention to. So when a whaling captain said, you know, if you travel this way, you'll get there faster than if you go the way that you are going, they were generally ignored. Well, so Franklin sat down with his cousin and sketched out this map. And it's not a, you know, perfect map or anything like that, but what it shows is this river, this river of water, the Gulf Stream, that's moving north, northeast, along the coast and then eventually towards the east along the coast of the United States. So this is really one of the first maps or the earliest maps of the Gulf Stream credited to Benjamin Franklin. In fact, Franklin, as he made some trips himself from the United States to Europe, actually took some water temperature measurements, took a bucket, took it over the side and put a thermometer in it, and he actually documented differences in temperature because this is a warm water current. So the water is warmer here than when you're not in the Gulf Stream. So he actually did a little bit of oceanography at the same time. He actually shaved a couple of weeks of time off the delivery of mail between Europe and the United States because now the mail ships wouldn't try to go against the current on their way through the U.S. 
and the mail ships leaving the US could take this current and travel faster to Europe and of course mail, sh mail ships or any kinds of ships um, would try to avoid the current, take a more southerly route and get there faster. Well, this whole idea of being able to use ocean currents as kind of a freeway system really set in motion the kinds of studies of physical oceanography and some of the really uh, first applied studies of oceanographies. And one of the people that really did a tremendous job with that was Matthew Maury, who's considered by some to be the father of physical oceanography. Maury was a naval officer. He was injured, falling off of a horse, and confined to a desk job. But what he did was gather the logs of all the ships that he could find traveling across the ocean. In fact, he held some of them hostage, so to speak. Um, I won't give you a map unless you tell, give me some information. And in collecting all that information, Maury was able to put together some of the earliest world maps of ocean circulation. Imagine if you were trying to get from one city to the next without a map, without that map that tells you which freeways to take. Well, that's what it was like doing shipping in the, you know, any century previous to the 18th century, really, or late 18th century. Well, with Maori's maps, people could spend a month less or save lots of time moving goods from one place to the other via ship. So once those freeway system maps of the ocean, those ocean circulation maps were made available to people, it really changed the way we look at the ocean and really helped drive ocean research at the same time. And we have Maori and really Franklin to thank for that kind of effort. <clears throat> well, uh, this is a little sidelight, but I want to make you aware of a ship called the, a submersible called the Ben Franklin. When I was a young boy, I was uh, some 14 years old, in 19, 13 years old in 1969, this submersible named after Ben Franklin traveled in the Gulf Stream. They went out, they just descended into the middle of the Gulf Stream and traveled for 30 days. And it's been written up uh, in a couple great books, but one I think is just called The Gulf Stream. And they just drifted, several men in a tin can, drifted in the ocean for 30 days. An extraordinary voyage, but a little known voyage. And it's little known because at the same time, the Apollo landing on the moon happened. And so this mission underneath the ocean was completely overshadowed by that.